welcome, Dean Konana. It is lovely to have you. It's wonderful talking to you, Dean. So we're just going to talk about a couple of teaching questions uh, and really thinking about something that the faculty can learn from you, given what big a role that teaching has played in your life. So I'll be very glad to share my thoughts. My first question is a simple one. How do you find that line between challenging the students, making sure that they're getting the content that they need, um, but also sort of hearing and listening to the students? It, it's teaching is not about what you think is important, right? Uh, teaching is how do you convey that, why it is important. And also more importantly is trying to understand the students who are in front of you. When you understand who are, who are the students who are sitting in front of you and know how they learn, their background, you'll be an effective teacher. Simply because I know a lot doesn't mean the students will appreciate that you know a lot. It's about how do you communicate that information to the students, they feel it's important and they perceive the value at the end. I entirely agree. I sometimes think that teaching is like translation where you have all of the knowledge contained in you, you've done the research, you're the expert, but delivering that in a way that the students can receive is sort of the skill. So what is the secret to your success as an educator, do you think? The first thing is I do trust my students. When you start with that notion, I trust the students. A lot of things that we talk about ethics and other things will fall automatically. For example, you give assignments and you tell them, don't talk to anybody when you do this. How am I going to stop them if they're roommates from not talking about assignments or anything? So what I do is I trust them. I tell them, if you are in really in trouble, you're not able to make progress. Ask for help and write down whom you got your help from. To create the trust, it takes a long time. To break it, it takes seconds. And I reinforce that in class. So I trust you. So when you reinforce that with the students, very rarely they break the trust. I love that you've shared that. I think trusting students is one of those pieces that you're never going to be taught how to do that. I mean, you're never going to learn it in your PhD. You're not going to probably find it in your research. But if you walk into the class, assuming that your students are going to meet your expectations, I find that they often do, as long as they know your expectations. Um, just as a next question, it's sometimes easier to talk about successes, of course, but can you think of a time that you had a teaching challenge? What happened? How did you learn from it? Wow, that's actually a great question. We don't tend to focus on the challenges. We always trying to find, oh, students don't understand. Students uh, think it's too difficult or students cannot handle it. On the other hand, I can tell you oh, a very interesting situation that I got into in teaching. Teaching adults in working professional is very challenging, not because the content is hard. The question is, how do you engage them? And that's why we have to be very careful. So this was a case discussion. A couple of them had no interest in that topic. They were just doing their own stuff. They were disrupting my class and I was getting more and more irritated by that disruption. And they were making snide comments and that is to get me angry. So what happened is instead of engaging them in a more useful way and involving other students in that debate, I started debating with tense tone with the students and that anger took over in the class. I suspect students would have been okay if I had shown an anger and moved on, but because it persisted in my conversation and the debate with them about the topic, I lost all the students that semester. So even a case discussion, when something like that happens is you have to learn how to engage them in a more fruitful discussion and get others involved. Don't get into debate with them one-on-one. -on -one. In a case discussion is how do you get the students engaged with the other students and you are facilitator and I lost that. So I learned my lesson. Somebody might push you to the edge. You always have to hold very steady is how do you get them engaged? In fact, now I learned the technique of, if, I, if they disrupt you, I would actually make a joke, but don't get angry in class because once you get angry, students only remember that you don't know how to control yourself. 
So I, I have to just thank you for such a vulnerable answer. I think you're right. Sometimes when we talk about teaching challenges, we sort of package it in a way that it's really something that we did really well. And I, I think it's wonderful that you're able to share that you learned something from that um, and that you were able to address it in your teaching moving forward, because sometimes we don't get to fix it that semester. No, that it's very, really, that's what I, I talk about to many of my colleagues, right? is you'll rarely see me getting angry in class. It's very, very hard, however disruptive you are, but I never show my anger. It may be once I come to my office, I might throw things, but not in class. Absolutely, you're still human, um, but when you're at the top of the room, being able to keep your composure is, is such an important skill, but it does, it does happen, uh, we're human. And so it's sort of natural that those moments come up for people. Um, so my next question is sort of a big question, um, which is in what ways do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has changed teaching and higher education? I think how challenging this COVID was, it has done one thing for higher education. They always assume that we need big buildings, we need students in class, we need professional students in class to be effective. What we discovered with COVID-19 is there are many different ways to reach the students, many ways to impart knowledge, in many different ways they can participate in your class. And many of them figured out that you can do certain things very well. Not all the things, certain things. For example, I'm teaching a very complicated math intensive class. A lot of my colleagues told me, you know what? I always start in the middle or to the top, never to the bottom. So what happens is sometimes you lose that bottom half, probably need the greatest help. So what COVID-19 realized is that when I deliver in a record, students who missed out certain things couldn't follow, they can always rewind and follow them and come back and catch up with the material. In a class, when they fall behind, there's no way they can catch up for the next half an hour or 45 minutes. You lost them. So you start to see there are certain benefits. So the whole idea of flipping the class, you're now literally making it happen. It took decades trying to tell faculty how to flip class with no success. And today faculty themselves are volunteering, volunteering saying, I'm going to flip my class because it is being very effective. That's one. Second one is, in the business school, we reach a lot of uh, working professionals. By definition, working professionals have real life of working and they have families. Sometimes they can't come to class physically, but they can actually join you remotely and they can participate remotely. Now faculty have learned how to work with students inside the class and in remote and how to engage all of them at the same time. If we had gone back a year ago and asked, or two years ago, we are going to do it, the answer is there is no way you can do it. Today, technology is allowing you to do it. So you're going to see how we reach the students, working professional full-time students. Um, you start to see the way we are okay to have some students in remote join in the class. It's helping. It is also helping from a business school perspective, reach new segment of the market for executive education, for uh, MBA program, working professional, you see a different ways is going to morph. So COVID has helped us experiment new ways of pedagogy. And I think people are realizing, ah, it can be very effective. So we're going to see educational system itself going to evolve around this, not only for working professional, not only in the MBA program, even for undergraduate. I absolutely agree with you. I especially think uh, you mentioned two years ago, if you had prompted faculty, oh, let's flip all of your classes. They would have said, absolutely impossible. This yeah. topic, this topic, this topic can't be moved online. Yeah. Um, but I do want to affirm something very important that you mentioned, which was there are students who would have been left behind who yeah. aren't being left behind anymore, um, which is sort of an amazing gift that technology is able to give us. Um, and I know you were a first generation student. I too was a first generation student. Um, and I think about how difficult it would have been for me to take classes during those, those difficult pandemic times. Um, and so I often think about those first generation students. And like you said, students balancing lives and families and professional obligations uh, with the classroom. So I really appreciate you, you mentioning that. 
And I'll just give you an example is, I've spoken to faculty where their office hours, hardly anybody comes. It turned out with Zoom, they had more people coming to office hours virtually because they didn't have to come all the way, a mile away to come and meet the faculty. They could just from their dorm, zoom into the faculty and have conversation, right? So people are recognizing, wow, there are benefits of using this. And so I have seen faculty who are vehemently opposed to anything online, are embracing online. Is it a perfect substitute? No. Is it a perfect complement? Yes. I absolutely want to second what you've said. So I was speaking to the new faculty who just joined us, who I'll ask you about in just a minute. Um, and I said to them, technology makes nobody a great instructor, but it can be a great impediment or it can be a great boon to great instruction. Um, and I see that with some of the faculty who, like you said, were quite opposed and then they've thrived online. Um, and at Smith in particular, so many C-level sweet guest speakers who of course wouldn't have time to, to come in person. So it does have its advantages. Yeah, you, you're going to see uh, education is going to transform. I need to bring a guest speaker from New York into my class. It's basically a matter of few seconds to get them into the classroom before they had to travel. It's always harder to do it. So you're going to see the true experiential learning and working with or listening to the executives, having conversation with the executives, with the industry folks is actually getting simpler now because there's an openness to this idea. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. So I have one final question, which is what would you tell any new faculty member who's joining teaching for the very first time now at this juncture of education? So this is my favorite. It's not what you know. This is not what to teach either. It's the most important thing you have to pay attention is how to teach and how much do you understand your students? So pay attention to understanding your students and how to teach because most of us with PhDs know what, know what to teach. The question is how to teach. And more importantly is recognize every student who sits in front of you, one day probably will achieve far more than you which means you treat them with the greatest respect that one day they're going to accomplish far more than what I have. And that's the way you look at them. That's a wonderful response. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we appreciate it having you and I can't wait for the faculty to hear about your perspective on teaching. Thank you, Darren. It was wonderful talking to you.